better without a trailer, baby. Where are we going to fit all the people and all the work? Fourteen, and then all the other bands will be six more seats. So we can take out the other seats. I would do trailer, but if you want to do all the work for it, then you can. I can't lift, dude, so. Well, oh, let's I'm just out. keep it out. It's a lot easier. All right. All right. Get the trailer Cooler, on coolers, there. Coolers, all them coolers. Can you plus get the luggage. trailer on there? It's all on there. Okay. All I got to do is when everybody leaves, I'm going to pull up by the kitchen door, and I'll fill up the coolers, and I'll load them up. So we'll say we got a couple of them. What? I was talking to Laney. Oh. Hey, prayer and everything offering. Good morning, Dorisville. How are we doing out there? Good. Hey, it's good to see your smiling face this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We got a lot of things happening. Uh, let me go through the list a little bit. Uh, today at 2 o'clock, uh, that's Brent time, not trade time. Trade's about 145, but... Uh, Two o'clock, we'll be pulling out of the parking lot. So if you're wanting to go to Current River or Discovery Ministry or uh, the annual canoe trip, be up here. No youth impact tonight. That's all going to be at the river, so please be aware of that. But uh, we're going to leave around 2 o'clock today. I do have a couple extra spots from cancellation, so if you're wanting to go, let me know, okay? and Or let Trey know, and we'll get you scheduled. Uh, also... Man, the Lord's been moving in great ways around here. we got several people waiting to be baptized. Man, let's give the Lord a round of applause. That's awesome. The way it looks right now, on the 27th, we're going to have a great big baptismal service. So you guys get pumped, ready to shout, ready to do whatever. And if you need to make that uh, decision to be baptized, man, we want to put that out there on the 27th. So please uh, make the arrangements and get that thing done, okay? Because God is wanting you to make sure that you know him and just shout it to the world that you're committed to him, okay? Isn't that awesome? That's what baptism does, okay? So on the 27th. Uh, man, are you guys ready to worship today? Yes, okay. Ushers, if you'll come forward, please. Church, if you'll stand, I'm going to leave us in a word of prayer. Oh, okay. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you just be here in this midst. Heavenly Father, we're excited about seeing your spirit move amongst us. Heavenly Father, be with this uh, time as uh, we get ready to celebrate with baptism on the 27th. Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts, prepare our attitudes, prepare us, Heavenly Father, for a move of you. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that you just uh, be in our midst today. As Brother Dwayne opens your word today, I just pray that it penetrate our hearts be with the people that stand in need of prayer today, dear my Father, that are hurting, that, uh, man, just need to know that you love them. And, dear my Father, I just pray that you wrap your loving arms around them. Help us to be a light to show your caringness, dear my Father. And I just pray that you just be with our young people as they get ready to go down to the river, that you would show up in mighty ways in their lives. And, dear my Father, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Now, all God's people said... Amen. If you'll uh, be seated, Allison's got a special for us, and we're going to get ready to worship.
What a glorious day that'll be. What a glorious day it is today. We're going to stand. We're going to sing and worship together. We ask you to join us. You can stand. You can sit. Altar's always open as well. But uh, what a great uh, morning. We get to come together and worship our King here together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried. High. It was my sin till I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. John 11, where Jesus uh, raised a dead man to life. The name was Lazarus. He was outside of the tomb. He said, Lazarus, come out. He says the same thing to me and you today. He tells us to come out of our grave. He knows your name. He knows my name, and he calls us out. We have been set free. In 1 Corinthians, it says, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? I'm sure you've heard that verse. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. 
But thanks be to God, verse 27, or 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can be thankful today for the hope and the joy that comes from knowing that Jesus has given us a new life. Death was arrested, and we have a new life through him. So join us as we sing. sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to be found. Your love made a way to let mercy come in, when death was rest. Oh, yo. 
God welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserved says, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for all, for all of us. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, 
Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who am I that the highest king would wear? But he brought me and oh his love for me. Oh his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh is free. His grace runs through. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for. Chosen 
Father, um, what a great reminder that in our Father's house, in your house, there's a place for us when we ask you to come and live in our hearts. And so, Lord, while we are here struggling with flesh, with sin, um, with temptation, all of those things, God, I pray that we would stay focused on why we are here, to go and make disciples in all the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, as we listen to the sermon today, God, I pray that our hearts would be in tune with what it has for you to tell us. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded that, that nothing can separate us from your love. No matter what we do, we are not that powerful because you are. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would be with Dwayne, that you would anoint him with your words, and that you would give each of us in this, in this room right now a stillness, a quietness, and ears to listen to what you have to say. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, like, for instance, this morning I added John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And right there it was, you know, right there. He had no idea I was, I was using that scripture. And it's just real affirming uh, how much God cares and how much he wants to be involved in our, our worship today and how much he wants to be involved in your life. And I really want you to know this. I hope that today, uh, whether you're a first-time guest or whether you're here every week, you know, you'll take something home today. This is a very special message for me because it hits right where I live. These are things that I read. I guess this whole series, to be honest with you, is going to be things that, that hit right where I am. And the series is called Ghostbusters. And you might want to know, well, let's read the tagline, Getting the Ghost Before They Get You. 
and more specifically, getting your get ghost before they get you. And you say, okay, where did all that come from? Well, the hint might be Pac-Man, all right? Way back in Bible school, back in June, um, the guys did this incredible background. Uh, I mean, they worked so hard on this. It was just awesome. And um, so when we got done with Bible school, I said, you know, it just seems a shame to use that one time and, and not use it again. And so I asked um, Jeff and Trey, I said, hey, can we get this thing and store it somewhere in here and use it again in a sermon series? And they said, yeah, we could do that. So you may have seen it unlit, leaning up against the wall over here by the missions map. And that's where it stayed for the last couple of months. And now it's back up on the stage. And once again, I just appreciate their hard work um, in creating that. Let me tell you just a little bit. Now, this they say probably when you have to take 15 minutes to explain your sermon series, it may not be clear. I don't know. But anyway, in this particular case, you know, if you're not familiar with Pac-Man, this is Mr. Pac-Man here. And he, he goes around going, oh, 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 and he eats the little dots, okay? And all the time, these ghosts are running around really trying to eat him, okay? And then, um, not on this board, but, but there would be this like, like disc, and the Pac-Man would come along, and he would eat the little disc, and that gave him superpowers, and all of a sudden, the ghost stopped chasing him, and he started chasing the ghost, and he had a few seconds, maybe 15, 10 seconds, to go eat the ghost before they could eat you, okay, and that's kind of the thrust of the game. Well, I don't know if you ever thought there was really a deep spiritual reason why we come up with these series, you know. They don't come in the mail. Well, this one got very deep and spiritual, but it's pretty cool. But anyway, so we're going to look at Ghostbusters today, starting today. And we're going to look at some things in life um, that are challenging to us that really we need to get a handle on before they get a handle on us. So our intro says this, okay. Most of us wrestle. Now, I need to stop. I need to stop. Because this is funny. Uh, Amy Daniel, uh, just a real precious lady who lives away from here now. And uh, she, was, she was looking at the slides. And her mom came up afterwards and said, Hey, Amy said you misspelled wrestle. And it's funny because she looked at the man. No, he didn't. Yeah. Well, she knows me well because I normally say wrestle. You know, so, so most of us, W-R-E. W-R-A-S-T-L-E, we wrestle, we wrestle. I thought it was so cute. Here she is way over, way far from us and wrote that in this morning. So most of us wrestle um, with life ghosts, with life ghosts, um, things that can frighten us and overwhelm us and paralyze us. And we all, now the, the ones I've chosen, my, I may have chosen because they're close to me, but we all have these things in our life that really mess with us, Okay. It, these ghosts. And, and they do. Sometimes they frighten us. Sometimes they overwhelm us. And sometimes they paralyze us. And things like, and here are the four things I want to look at um, the next four weeks as we look at, look at Ghostbusters. And I want us to look at it and see, okay, how can we overcome these things in our lives? You know, one is regret. Regret. Um, we all have regrets in our lives. I, I, as I studied for this, I, I go online and look for quotes and things. I was amazed at the number of people that said, famous people, that said, the only regrets I have are the things I didn't do. Now, that's okay, but let me just tell you something. My grace professor and I something I did do. The problem is things I did do uh, that I shouldn't have done. But what I found out about regret is, now listen, regret makes us slaves to the past. Now, write that down if you're a note taker. Regrets make us slaves to the past. The regrets overwhelm us, and they put us in bondage for things that happened in our past. That's what we're talking about today. Next week, we're going to look at circumstances, circumstances, okay? And, and those, those make us um, slaves to the present, what's going on in our lives right now. When we are overwhelmed with our circumstances, we become slaves to our present day, our present day. Um, and then we have this thing, boy, these are just things I wrestle with, rejection. You know, when somebody says, don't want you anymore, don't like you anymore, you know, you go back to the playground, you know, when you're the last kid being kicked for the, picked for the kickball team and, you know, they didn't want you, or, or maybe your friend on the playground says, well, I won't be your friend anymore. You know, and you feel this rejection going on, okay, all right? And, and that makes us, when we allow rejection to haunt our lives, 
um, it, it become, makes us a slave to others, to other people. We give them rent in our heads and rent in our heart, and it overwhelms us. And then finally, this thing called change. And, uh, you know, they only say the only constant in life is change, okay? But it's the, it makes us fear of the unknown, fear of the unknown. Um, so, so we have these four things, and they can Im, Im, Im put us in prison. They can enslave us if we allow them to. Now, listen, I know, I know, some of you guys are Mr. Optimistic and Mrs. Optimistic. Never, you say, I don't wrestle those kind of things. Well, you know somebody who does, so go ahead and listen today and, and then apply it and give it away somewhere. But a lot of us, this is where, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you're a pastor, okay? I live with this stuff in my life. And as I was studying for this, it's just poured into my heart um, this morning. That's why the song spoke so much um, to my life. So, so how, do you, how do you begin to overcome? How do, you, how do you overcome these ghost life ghosts in your life? Okay. Well, the, it begins with sometimes, sometimes we just need a jailbreak. Sometimes we need someone who can set us free from the prisons. Sometimes someone who will buy us off the slave market, whether it be regret or circumstances or, or rejection or change, whatever it might be. Someone who will pay the... Re- well, that's good. Somebody who will pay the redemption price and get us out of prison. Sometimes we need that. I, you know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4, you know, he said, our weapons, our weapons are powerful. Our weapons are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. Wow, that's good. That's good. So, so sometimes we need a jailbreak. Sometimes we just need a win. We need a win. And once again, I'm sitting there watching the Holy Spirit work. You know, when, when Trey has read, you know, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. You know, that, I went in my notes. I, I wrote it down this morning. And we were, you know, the Holy Spirit just hooked it all together. You know, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we need a win. And sometimes we just need a healthy dose of courage. Psalm 27, um, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Now, that's hard to do, isn't it? Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. You know, Brent's favorite verse, and it's definitely on my list, is, you know, Joshua 1, 9. I don't have it memorized, but it just talks over again. You will know, be strong, be courageous. I'll be with you. Be strong, be courageous. I'll be with you. Be strong and courageous, and I'll be with you. And, and so we have this God is not, what we hear in our songs today, He is for me, not against me. Hey, boy, if you take nothing home but that today... Burn it in your head. There's too many preachers and too many churches will tell you how God is mad at you. No, God loved you. In fact, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in this this Jesus of the cross, you know, can have eternal life. God is for you. Um, He is not against you. So so I hope you'll take that home um, with you today. Now, our great, our Ghostbuster verse, okay, is First John and chapter five and verse number four. Um, this is from the ESV. You know, who is it that overcomes the world? Now, trust me, I'm smart enough to know there are people out there in the world who don't believe in God, don't know, can't spell God, has never even turned around a church parking lot, okay, and they seem to be doing quite well in life. Thank you, sir. I understand that. But from a, from a Jesus follower perspective, you know, this becomes very important to me. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes in G- that Jesus is the Son of God? You know, for a, for a Jesus follower, that is so powerful, okay? The ability to overcome the ghost, okay? The, the ability to have a ghost buster, the ability to get the ghost before they get you rest in that verse, who is it that overcomes the world? Who is it that gets free from prison except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that was the other verse. I added it this morning. Trey did not know that I was, um, was using it. And there it was. You know, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. John eight thirty six. Who the Son sets free 
is free indeed. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So our teaching point then, our first teaching point begins with this. The prison, and again, if you're a note taker, circle that one in your Bible or in your notes. The prison of our past and our regrets. That's exactly what it is. I, you know, I, there's not this huge skeleton in my closet. Um, but I just need to be honest with you and tell you that, that there are so many things in my life I've got regrets about. And, and again, Dwayne, do you regret getting out of the Air Force and going to ministry? Absolutely not. Um, do you regret marrying Judy? Are you nuts? She's the best thing that ever happened to me besides Jesus. Do you regret having three girls? Well, I would prefer to have a son in there somewhere, number four. But the three girls I got, I'm wild about, you know. Eight grandchildren. You know, all those things are good, okay. But the bottom line is there's just some regrets. Um, and, and, and they eat me. You know, I say something I didn't mean to say. I do something I didn't mean to do. Um, I'm tempted, and I go ahead and give in. I'm going, why did you do that for? You know, I'm on this healthy eating thing, and, and next thing I know, I'm eating something that's not healthy, and then i got this guilt and shame coming in. Are, are, are you getting it with me? This is something I live with, and maybe you do too. Maybe your regrets are bigger than that. We're going to talk about a Bible hero who had huge regrets today. But the prison of our past okay, and that's fear, and our regrets, that's guilt and shame, okay, those things are huge for us. I mean, do you ever live with this when we talk about our past? Four words, four words. What if they knew? What if my wife knew? What if my husband knew? What if my parents knew? What if, what if my boss knew? What if my church family knew? They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even let me go to church anymore if they only knew. So, so the, the past is a very fearful thing, and there's, there's guilt and shame in our regrets, and it can be an incredible stronghold in our lives. But what was that verse again? For 2 Timothy 10, 4, our weapons are powerful through God for the dem demolition of strongholds. In other words, God can help us tear that stuff down, tear that prison down, bust open the bars, bust, bust open the doors. The prison of our past and our regrets can be incredible strongholds. Try as we may, it may seem impossible. But I'm so glad to tell you today, listen carefully, that what seems impossible without God is possible with God. What seems impossible without God is possible with God. Okay, it may seem impossible to overcome and break free. Now, here's, here's where we get into the nitty-gritty. Saul, also named Paul, knew this and wrestled with his past and present. Okay, so we got this supercharged Bible hero who wrestled with this. Now, I need to pause and tell you a little bit of his story because I think we sometimes put people like Paul on this pedestal and think he didn't have baggage. You know, Paul had so much baggage. And by the way, his name was Saul and then it was translated, I think, into the Greek. That was in the Hebrew and in the Greek it, it was called Paul. So Saul, Paul, same person. But, but, but he had so much baggage, he had one under each arm and one on each hand, and he is totally weighted down. Well, Dwayne, where did it come from? Well, we're not sure where, where Saul was in the crucifixion of Jesus. He was certainly a, a young adult. He was around. We're just not recorded what role he played. But after that and after the resurrection, um, Saul, was a, Saul Paul was a, a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a zealot for the Judaism, for the law. And here's the bottom line. Number one, he hated Jesus. There was not one pleasant memory he had of Jesus. He was a Jesus hater. And number two, he hated every follower of Jesus. He saw them as heretics and destroyers of his faith. He hated them. In fact, the very first martyr was a guy named Stephen. <laughs> they made him a deacon and then they stoned him. Go figure, right? But anyway, yeah. So, so here's Stephen, you know, and he preaches this powerful message. And, and the Judaizers got so mad, they decided to stone him. And they pick up these rocks and all you hear you know, are rocks hitting soft flesh. What a way to die. And guess who's holding the coats? Of all the ones who are stoning him. Yeah, that would be Saul. That would be Saul. He hated Jesus. He hated Jesus' followers. Well, 
if you can imagine. I mean, he, he had people arrested. He had authority to do that because of his position. He had people arrested, may have had them put to death. So this guy has a lot of baggage. And so he goes to the, goes to the high council and says, hey, listen, I would like to go over to Damascus and kind of continue my mission. I know there's a lot of people of the way. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, truth, and life. So people were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way. He said, I know in Damascus there's a lot of people who follow Jesus, and I want to go persecute them. I want to arrest them. I want to stop this movement. So they say, okay. So, so he gets his letter, and he's on his way to Damascus, and all of a sudden, the resurrected Jesus shows up on the road. There's this brilliant light. He falls down to his face, and here's the voice he hears. My, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I'm sure Saul's going, I ain't persecuting you. I'm persecuting those people. But here's the deal. You know, when you mess with God's people, you mess with God. When you mess with God's people, you mess with God. So anyway, bottom line is, he receives Jesus on the road to Damascus. He becomes a Jesus lover, not a Jesus hater. He's struck blind in the process. They take him by the hand, and they lead him into Damascus. He goes into Damascus, and I mean, he is bold for Jesus now. As much as he hated Jesus, he loves Jesus, and he's telling the message how Jesus is the Son of God, and how Jesus died on a cross, and we can put our faith and trust in him. He was bold in his faith. Well... They tried to kill him there, and so he decided to leave town and went to Jerusalem, the the center of Christianity. I mean, you know, let's find some people who think like I do. It didn't quite work out very well. Let's look at our first verse. It's Acts chapter 9, verse 26. So when Saul left Damascus, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, okay, (laughs) he, he tried to go to church. And they said, we don't want you. You ever feel that way? You know, you, you go to a church and like, you're not dressed right. You've got too many tats. You've got too many piercings. You know, you're not welcome here. You know, well, that's what happened to him. Okay? So, so when he, he, he um, tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. And again, keep in mind, rightfully so, the people in Jerusalem, they had relatives that were in jail because of him. They, they, had, they had relatives who were dead, maimed because of him. When they saw him, uh, you know, you know they, they wanted nothing to do with him. They were terrorized by him. Well, they, now, now he said, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm one of y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, sure you are. Doesn't that happen? Doesn't that happen in church? Person comes in, I met Jesus, and... We look at him like Kappa and Newgate. Now, sure, sure you are. Sure you are. Sure you are. You don't look like us. You don't talk like us. You don't even smell like us. Sure, sure you're a believer. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. And that's, that's one part of it. There's, that, was the, that was the first anchor, okay? They simply could not believe. They could not believe that the guy who, who hated Christians so much and hurt Christians so much could ever become one. They couldn't believe it. Secondly, they couldn't believe that God would allow him to be one. Allow him to be one. How, how could God allow him in, to become a believer? Don't we do that? Aren't there people that, that were like, in our estimation, were such big sinners, and, and they get saved? How could God ever forgive? Come on, come on, come on. We all wrestle with the thief on the cross. What do you mean he went to heaven? He only repented because he was dying. You know, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. He only did it because he's about to die. And he got in. He sure did. He sure did. I'm glad. Listen, I don't know a lot of some of y'all today. And you know, I don't know all the people that you know. But you need to tell them this. And I'll tell you this this morning. That no matter how big your sin debt is, Jesus can handle it. God can handle it. Grace can handle it. You are not outside the realm of God's amazing grace and His power to forgive your sin and erase your past. How incredible is that how incredible but they couldn't believe i say they couldn't believe it and they couldn't believe that god would let them in uh you know let him in to the kingdom so 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 it's important then from our teaching point the greatest now listen this is the little painful part 
often the greatest obstacle to breaking free from our past, the greatest obstacle to getting out of our prison of regret, are those around us who, have, who are long on memory and short on grace. Long on memory, short on grace. I mean, you know, a dude, a dude or a dudette commits all this sin and they meet Jesus and, and, and the person says, well, you know, they did this and they did that. Their, their mantra is, you know, once always. Once a liar, always a liar. Once an adulterer, always an adulterer. Once an addict, always an addict. Long on memory. Aren't you glad God's not long on memory? Aren't you glad that the Bible... Yeah, come on. Hey, aren't you glad the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, He cast our sin? Hey, in fact, it says, and He remembers them no more. It's just not true in the Christian world. We seem to have long memories. And we're a little bit short on grace. See, you can't be a rock chucker and be long on grace. You can't be a rock chucker. Oh, we like, you know, boy, when somebody messes up, well, if we're not careful, we love, we love to be a rock chucker. And we can't be that. You know, Paul said in Ephesians 4, 29, the first part, and then verse number 32, you know, he says this, let no corrupt, somebody say no. No, that means no. You know, that means like no. You know, dad can have $100. No, okay? So let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, okay? But only such as is good for building up. In other words, you know, this, this stuff should not come out, okay? All right? But no, we should have things that build up. We should, have, we should be regret removers and not regret, regret intensifiers. We should be regret removed. We should, when a person has a past, and by the way, we all have a past, okay? So when we have this past, okay, rather than intensify the regret, we should remove, help the person remove the regret. They need to know. I love this about our church. Man, there's some guys sitting in our room right now who've given their testimony. They spent time. And I don't mean time at McDonald's, time in prison. And they are welcome here. Welcome here. Come on, yeah, come on. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it should be. Should be. We need to be regret removers and not regret intensifiers. Intensifiers. Be kind. Why is it we seems to me that sometimes the world is more kind than we are? Why is it? Why is it that one of the talk show hosts of a very popular TV show is one of the kindest people, is known as one of the kindest people. Why is it us? Why are we known as the kind people? Why is it? Because Jesus was kind. Anybody want to argue that point with me? He was kind. We should be kind. We should be kind. Again, we should help people get over the regret by being kind. Be kind to one another, wholehearted, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us. So here's Saul. He's wandering around town. You know, you know, I'm so lonesome I could be. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat a worm. Big ones, fat ones, little tiny skinny ones. I'm going to go eat a worm. Nobody wants anything to do with him. And then it happens. Look at the next verse. Verse 27a. Then Barnabas. Then Barnabas. Barnabas was a key player in the early church. And, and Barnabas, you're going to see it in the next slide, but I'll go ahead and do a spoiler for you. Literally in the Bible, guess what his name means? Guess what they called him? Yeah, son of encouragement. That's exactly right. The son of, oh, here comes Barney, the son of encouragement. Everywhere he went, he encouraged people. Barnabas was a regret remover, not a regret intensifier. You know, Barnabas was so much like Jesus. 
Everywhere he went, he encouraged people. He loved on people. He cared for people. I mean, he was willing. What he does now in this verse is huge. I mean, he puts his reputation on the line. Nobody wants to hang around Saul, and he goes and gets Saul. It's just what Jesus would do. It's just what Jesus would do. It's amazing. So, so he, he goes and he brings him to the apostles. Now, the apostles were the, the big dogs, you know, the guys who walked with Jesus. There were 11, and then they got Matthias, and that made 12 again. These are the church leaders. So he didn't take them to the local church and try to convince them, you ought to love Saul, you ought to trust Saul. He takes them to the leadership, okay? And, and then he vouches, he vouches, he vouches for Saul. He says, hey, listen, you know, he, you know, he, would, he had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus. He vouched him. He wasn't there. He heard Saul's testimony. Oh, gosh. He, saw, he heard Saul's testimony, and he believed it. Come on, you've been to a testimony service before, and you went, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, right. He didn't. He heard Saul's testimony. He believed it. He said, hey, listen, listen. This man saw the Lord, the resurrected Lord, on the way to Damascus. And, and guess what? The Lord spoke to him. The Lord spoke to him. Wow. Talking about willing to take a risk. Okay, so what does our teaching point say? We should strive to be a Barnabas, also known as the son of encouragement. Listen, 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 listen. Listen to me. The world already has enough cynics and critics. Cynics cast doubt. There's enough doubt in the world. Don't join the cynic club. Don't join the critic club. Join the Jesus club. What Jesus would do, let's do. And what Jesus wouldn't do, don't do. I love, you know, Jesus, you know. It never grows old with me. Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was the most li- least likely candidate to be a disciple, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Jesus goes to him and says, hey, you want to come? I imagine Peter's going, you've got to be kidding me. A tax collector? Why would he invite a tax collector into the group? But he did. Because that's what Jesus does. He invites the least likely to come and be part of his team. Isn't that great? I want you to know that today. I don't know your life. I don't know your life. But man, if you're feeling like nobody loves me, everybody hates me, and nobody would ever want me if they only knew what I was or what I had been or what I did last night, they would never accept me. Jesus would accept you, and I pray to God we would too. I pray to God we would too. The world already has more than enough critics and more than enough cynics. Well, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul writes, So... So encourage each other and build each other up just as you're already doing. Now, this is so, this is so important. Um, instead of, instead of um, waiting for them to fail, let's help them succeed. If you know somebody and, and, you know, fail, 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 instead of waiting for them to fail again, why not take them to the apostles? Why not be willing to risk? You know, what would you be willing? Take the person you know that you have the least amount of faith in. Don't say your husband. What would you be willing to risk for them? What would you be willing to risk for them? We've got to be willing to take a risk with people if we're going to be like Jesus. Well, 27b, he also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Wow. So, so you know, God appears to him. Jesus appears to him. Jesus talks to him. He trusts Jesus. He preaches in Damascus. In a bold way, he steps up. He says so. And this is, this is so powerful. Now look at verse 28. Look at this. So Saul stayed with the apostles. Now, now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you getting this? Okay. He stayed with them. I don't know if that means like he you know, moved in and stayed. Or did he just, was he with them all along? It doesn't, I know this. It says this. And went all around Jerusalem with them. 
Okay, so, so here's this guy that God is going to use to write well over three-fourths of the New Testament. Here's a guy that most of us know Jesus because he was a great missionary to our part of the world. Okay, Here, here's a guy you know, who, who did more for the advancement of the early church than any other man we can name in the Bible. And you know why it all happened? Barnabas took him to the apostles. And the people... Saul, 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 what it works. Saul, Saul, you know, and said, hey, 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 listen, he, 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 the, the apostles accept him. Maybe we should too. Hey, the apostles have said, maybe we should too. And, and then he went around preaching boldly in Jerusalem about the Lord Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? See, see, here's the deal. You know, you know, Billy Graham wasn't born Billy Graham. I mean, he was more Billy Graham, but he wasn't born a great preacher. You know, you know, some, some guy named Mordecai uh, led him to the Lord. Remember Moody? Moody was an eighth grade dropout. You know, smoked cigars. And God used him to reach hundreds of thousands of people. He was the Billy Graham of his day. He didn't have the education. He didn't have the experience. But he had a heart for God. He had a heart for God. We don't know what God can do with a soul that you know that seems beyond hope. And you, dear friend, who have a past, you're saying, God could never use me. May I boldly stand before you today and say, that ain't so. That ain't so. Remember a guy named, I could do, we could go on and on, and we're not going to, but we could go on and on. Remember a guy named David? Yeah. Yeah, King David. Remember, I like, everybody likes King David. Yeah, the guy who had an affair. Yeah, he did. And, but, but, but more importantly, you know, the guy who killed Bathsheba's husband, murdered him. Well, had he murdered, you know? The guy who, in pride, numbered the people and 70,000 people died. Yet God still used him. The guy who said, hey, I, 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 these other guys may deny you, Jesus. I'll never deny you. And an hour later, he's sitting going, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And God used him. Don't let the regrets hold you back from being what God wants you to be. Have a boldness. Have a holy boldness. God, you said you are for me and not against me. And God, you said that you could use me. And determine, determine, determine what God wants you to do. And then do it. And then do it. And then do it. We're almost out of time. That's what we're supposed to say. Preach on. And flip now. Now here's this. The second part goes real fast. Real fast. I promise you, it goes real fast. So, so that's how Barnabas helped Saul get started. Okay, but let me ask you a question. That's great. But how did how did Paul deal with his past? Hey, how do you deal with your past? If you're like me, you eat at you sometimes. You tuck it away so nobody will ever find it. Because if they did, you wouldn't like, they wouldn't like you. So, so well, how, did, how did Paul handle his past? And man, this is one of my favorite, my favorite verses. Look at this. Look at this. Brothers and sisters. First he says in humility, I do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it. He goes, what I'm about to say, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say I mastered it. But look at this. Look at this. But one thing I do, and that's not like one thing. That's like a priority thing. One of the things that's most important is this. Forgetting what is behind. How did Paul deal with his past? He forgot it. How did he forget it? Not like you think. Because try as hard as you want to, and you can't forget your past. It's always there, isn't it? What Paul is saying is this. He reached a point in his life. Now listen, this is worth the price of admission. This is worth missing the golf course for. Okay, what he's saying is, is that I refuse to let my past control my future. I refuse to let my past come into my present and control my life. And we cannot physically forget, but through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit as Jesus followers, that's something all of us can do. 
we can say, I refuse to let that ghost crawl up into my present day and control my thinking, my attitudes, my heart, my priorities, control who I am. Forgetting what is behind. He had so much to forget. He had so much to forget. Forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Wow. I, I stumbled upon this verse, Isaiah 43. By the way, there's a, if you've got the worship app, there's a great quote there, but we're out of time. But look at Isaiah 43, 18, 19. This, I mean, I just stumbled into this. I've read the Bible through, but never, I just didn't get it. Do not remember the past events. Now, I know this is prophetic, talking about Israel, okay? But the principles are for us. Do not remember the past events. Okay, write that down. Number one, I'm going to choose not to remember the past events, okay? Two, pay no attention to things of old. Pay no attention. You know, when the ghost comes up and says, what if they know? Pay no attention to it. Pay no attention to it. Look. Look, God says to you today. Look. I am about to do something new. It's true in world prophecy. It's true in your life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Old things are passed away. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 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 I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Listen, God doesn't want to do something new in your life in 20 years. God doesn't want to do something new in your life next week. God wants to do something new in your life right now in this service, during this message and at our invitation time. God wants to do something new in your life. You just have to let him. You just have to let him. Do you not see it? Do you can't, can't you see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And he can, and he will. So how about it? Got some ghosts. I do. This is a big one. I guess, you know what you're going to, I've already figured it out. Next four weeks, you're going to see me being authentic because these are, I just, these are things I wrestle with. And I've got some regrets. And I've got to hurry on this because I'm, I'm going to be 70 pretty soon and I'm running out of time. Um, but God, help me, help me to not allow my regrets to move into my present. God, you forgave my sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And even if somebody drags it up and says, yeah, but you, last week you said this, or five years ago you did that, just tell them, hey, listen, that's forgiven. God doesn't remember it, and I choose not to remember it. If we can, if today, if we can help you find the man who died on the Roman cross for our sins, Jesus Christ, Brent's going to be standing out front. We'd love to tell you about, about Jesus and if we can help you pray through some strongholds that you're dealing with, it, with your regrets in your past, if, you're, you know, if your shame and guilt has got you locked up and keeping you from the life that God wants you to have, we would like to pray with you today. I, I want you to leave today with something more than you came in with. I would love for you to leave today with something more than you came in with. I think God wants that too. I, I know God wants that too. Let's pray. Boy, what a privilege to share today. Brent will be down front. Um, and uh, again, the altar is open if you want to come and pray. We've got some folks to be glad to pray with you. Uh, we'd love to do that. Um, but this is a big message. This truth, this is a big truth for us. Big truth. Father, thank you that we do not have to be bound up in prison by our regrets, by our past. Father, you, as Brother Brent quoted last week in 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Help us, Father, to believe that and live that. Help us, Father, to understand that our regrets, Father, we don't, they don't have the right to sneak into our lives today. And when people choose to bring them up, you refuse to. We are children of God blood-bought, redeemed, forgiven by your mercy. 
thank you for that. Have your way now in this time of decision. Speak to the hearts of your people as you see fit. In Jesus, I pray it in your precious name. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet today?
I think we probably need to praise the God who did it. Amen. All right, dear, dear. Um, great. You got Mike there, Brent? Uh, go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. Um, Jamal sent me a text that said, hey, you know, he's one of those guys that's got a past and experienced God's wonderful grace. And raise your hand, Jamal. Right there. There it is. You know, if you, if you want to chat with him about grace and forgiveness and all of that, you grab him after church. And uh, we'll give you a time to speak. Maybe even next week we'll see if we can work that in, okay? He's told his story before, but it's one of the stories that never, never grow old. Amen. And um, so, Brent, I think you've got a couple of uh, decisions to announce. Amen. All right, buddy. Man, is God good or what? He's yeah, he just is. working out here. Man. Come expecting good things from him. And uh, he's been moving. Oliver, you want to come up here? All right. He came from... Uh, man, what is that, click back there? Yeah. And he said, hey, I asked Jesus to come into my heart the other day, and I want to follow him in believer's baptism, and we're working with him, making sure he understands that and making sure that he knows what baptism is. But he said he wants to tell all of you that he invited Jesus Christ in his heart and is wanting to follow him in believer's baptism. And you all are... This is one proud mama right here, too. You just come by and encourage him after church, and that's pretty awesome. Then we got Anthony. Anthony, come on over. Anthony's been a part of our church for a long time. Anthony's a volunteer and a half. He does everything around here. I'm telling you, he's went to Caseyville. He's done a lot of things volunteering for the Lord to use him in mighty ways. And he says, God's been using him and having him walk by faith. And he says, hey, I want to rededicate my life, and I want to show God by being baptized again. So he's going to come forward today to, to get baptized and just to say, hey, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. And he's going to do that more often now. And he's just a little scared. It is a little scary when you walk by faith and not by sight. Because God doesn't always show you way out in, way out in the future what you're going to be doing. Because he's wanting you to trust him every step of the way. And that's what you do. One step at a time. He doesn't reveal more than that. But you walk by faith. And he's wanting to come forward and do that and to challenge you guys to walk by faith too. All right? Amen. So you stay up here. We're going to give you encouragement afterwards, too. So, man, we are excited that you came to Dorisville Baptist. You feel the spirit moving. The trick to that is don't say no. Continue to believe. Continue to trust. Continue to allow God to use you in mighty ways by saying, yes, Lord, I don't understand how it's going to get done, but I'm trusting you, okay? I'm trusting you to show me the next step, and God will do the next thing in your life, but you've got to trust. Let's all stay in this morning. I'm going to dismiss us. You come by and extend a right hand to fellowship and give them a hug on the neck. Tell me, Father, man, we are joyful, joyful today that you've been moving in our midst, that you're doing great and mighty things, dear my Father, that require us to trust you. And then, my Father, I just pray that you continue to move in our service, continue to move amongst us, continue to do the works that only you can do. And then, my Father, I know that there's some hurting people out here. There are some people out here that are looking for you to do great and mighty things. And then, my Father, I know that you can. I know that you will. And then, my Father, I just want you to work in these hospital situations, that you work in these situations that seem impossible that you do the things that you say that you can do. And then, my Father, we trust you. We trust you with all that we have, and we just pray that you would just do it. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.